The black rock we call coal is a gift of God. It is almost pure carbon, and carbon is the building block of all life. According to the majority of scientists who have the ear of Western governments, we have too much carbon in our atmosphere, and this overabundance of carbon is what they claim is causing climate change. In today's presentation, Carbon Capture, Storage and Utilization, I present three videos that explain how carbon capture is being used to create a carbon loop to reduce, reuse, and recycle carbon, as well as industrial and agricultural waste. Before I begin, I would like to remind Christian viewers that the concept of Christ being the rock, the stone upon which their church and faith are built, is biblical and no empty claim. Christians all over the world claim this rock is a divine gift and that this rock is the building block of all life and in the fullness of time, according to divine plan, this rock became human and will come again at the end of the age so that the faithful will shine like the sun. Down through the centuries, Many people have stumbled over the concept of a rock grasping the nature of God and man. Thinking like men and not like God, many people saw the cross as an anathema, and many still do. They cannot see how the lampstand Moses forged from coal became the light of the world that promises them a nice happy, everlasting life, full of everlasting hope, peace, joy, love, and light. Today, the idea of King Coal, the black rock, being a good source of energy, is an anathema. Coal mines and coal-generating stations are being closed down in Western nations, even though scientists agree that coal is mostly carbon and that carbon is the building block of all life. Human bodies contain carbon and expel carbon dioxide with every breath. So why is CO2 the big bad wolf that the vast majority of scientists now claim? There are other so-called pollutants associated with the burning, the combustion of coal and fossil fuel, such as sulfur, nitrogen, and fly ash. Regulations for cost-effective control of these so-called pollutants are cleaning up the coal and gas industry. The Boundary Bay Coal-Fired Generating Station in Saskatchewan, Canada is a success story. It has been capturing 90% of all its flue gases since 2014. This success is the equivalent of taking 900,000 cars off the road for a year. With new advanced technologies, this coal-fired power station and others like it in China and Russia will capture even more flue gases, if not all. Yet, the, pl the Paris climate talks are based on the premise that CO2 is the devil incarnate, the big bad wolf that must be eliminated and chained up permanently. Traditional songs that promote male-female courting practices, such as the farmer takes a wife, are now becoming socially inappropriate. Recently, my Chinese-Canadian hairdresser told me that many women in China have no intention of ever getting married and having children. Here in Canada, my 16-year-old granddaughter reassured me that if the new mRNA vaccine reduced or destroyed her fertility, she didn't care because she doesn't plan on having any children. Many people in Canada have been called right-wing extremists, racists, and conspiracy theorists because they have dared to openly protest and post their concerns on social media about the normalization and promotion of Adam and Steve, as well as what they believe is the agenda behind Bill Gates and Big Pharma. 
Bill Gates has openly admitted that he and others think overpopulation in Africa and India is a growing problem that needs to be controlled to sustain the planet and greenhouse gas emissions. So many people are suspicious of Bill Gates' endorsement of the new mRNA vaccines. Meanwhile, people that promote heterosexuality, having saying no to sexual promiscuity, adultery, abortion, sex change operations, and new tech vaccinations are under attack. Their posts are being labeled misinformation and they are being deplatformed and silenced. In addition, they are being labeled in the media and by their friends and family as right-wing extremists. Farmers, coal miners, diesel truckers, and oil patch workers who dare to protest government policies that they see as pandering to minority groups and corporate interests are being demonized as Trump supporters, proud boys, racists, insurrectionists, anti-vaxxers, and climate change deniers. Many alternative news outlets are being demonized too as conspiracy advocates. They claim that the World Economic Forum and Bill Gates are using the mainstream media and progressive modern democratic values to promote the queering of Christ, individualism, the 2S LGBTQ plus demographic, Big Pharma, and the zero carbon solution as the way of the future to create global totalitarianism with global elites such as Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and their corporations calling the shots. Why are many Christians, especially in the West, rejecting the black rock and going along with the queering of Christ? What is behind this rejection and demonization of fossil fuel and the black rock? Why can't black peat give coal to naughty boys and girls who have nothing so they can make and own nice things too? So as you watch the videos I have selected, ask yourself, if carbon is the building block of life on earth, why are world leaders and global corporate elites demonizing carbon? More importantly, ask yourself, why are Christians going along with this demonization? Why aren't more nice Christians lifting up their voices in support of the Black Rock? Are they too divided and too weak to take a stand for Christ? Are Christians being led astray by corporate media clips of climate disasters and overcrowding in hospitals? Is this why Christians have put their faith in the World Economic Forum and their scientists? Are Christians afraid they will cause more human suffering if they publicly proclaim Christ, the Everlasting Father, as the Black Rock, the foundation stone of their faith tradition that celibate and queer religious elites and chief global builders are demonizing, have demonized, exploited, exploited, enslaved, and abused to colonize and grow a global empire of wealthy elites. Two days ago, young global leaders reporting from the World Economic Forum disclosed that Africa must pay $2.8 trillion to meet its obligations under the Paris Agreement. The challenge for the fertilizer industry is the fact that we have a very carbon intensive technology which is vital for growing food. But also we know that world leaders have now accepted the fact that we are behind the eight ball and we need to catch up fast. Fertilizer production globally is broadly the same. Really they are using processes that are about 70 years old. Non-organic fertilizer has a huge carbon footprint. We need to reduce the emissions coming from the energy and industrial sectors if we are to reach net zero. CCM's technology captures carbon dioxide and other waste streams and either stores the captured material or converts it into resources like fertilizer or plastics. I'm going to borrow the quote from Mahatma Gandhi. 
waste is only a resource in the wrong place. That is the core tenet to what we do. I'm Pavel Kishlevsky, Chief Executive of CCM Technologies. Well, we have a fairly strange origin in the fact that Professor Peter Hammond and I were parents at the same school. My background is finance, his is a chemical engineer, and it was the combination of those two skill sets that founded the company back in 2011. When Peter and I founded the company, his intellectual property, which he's been developing over 25 years, is around CO2. But interestingly, he was looking at it as a solution for some of the engineering challenges that he was solving for big companies. And he turned his mind to suddenly realize that actually there was a way of capturing the CO2, the devil incarnate, and actually using that for a profitable and sensible method. It's got to be better. It's got to be as easy to use and it's got to be cheaper. And we've appreciated that from, from the beginning. There was a sort of circularity developing in the whole process and that led on very rapidly to us appreciating that if we could take materials from their end of life within waste and actually reintroduce them to the beginning of the cycle, that would be a really good process. Conventional nitrogen fertiliser production in particular is very energy intensive. In some cases, four, five, six, seven tonnes of emissions of CO2 for one tonne of fertiliser. Whereas our materials are neutral in that sense. CCM is able to produce fertilisers with a zero carbon footprint or even potentially climate positive, i.e. it's removing carbon from the atmosphere. The equipment you can see behind us is relatively straightforward. It's a mixing and blending technology, but is around really three inputs. Those are fibrous materials, any sustainable source really. So grass, straw, wood chip or digestate cake. Ammonia, which is recovered either from food or animal waste streams. Then carbon dioxide, which is generally recovered in our case from exhaust streams. And it's those three components which are currently considered waste that we can turn into something that's both valuable and also good for the environment. Wastewater is a very good example. At the moment, they are discharging phosphorus and ammonia into the groundwater. So rather than have them as a waste, recycle them back in and use them as the core nutrients to build fertilizer with zero carbon footprint. The key part of CCM's process is to deliver the farmer a fertilizer he actually wants and needs. So it's customizable to its nutrient ingredients. We have a solution that can be put to the rice crops, the largest crop in the world, but also sub-Saharan Africa as well, where clearly soil temperature is a big issue. We're also putting both organic matter and carbon in the form of calcium carbonate into the soil. So we're putting it back where it started from and closing the cycle. Another of Peter's real tenets is to ensure that the price point of the product is at least the same as the current environment, if not slightly better. Then you can actually mobilise agriculture as a massive tool in fixing the environment. We have to create a better climate and a better world for my grandchildren and everybody else's grandchildren. Agriculture is using a range of finite resources which will run out. Our process will allow the extension of those finite resources, but also in recovering them from waste materials, it actually creates a new resource base, but without changing the fundamental ways in which you deliver agricultural production. Carbon emissions, CO2. You've heard of it, you know it warms the planet, but did you know that this dress is literally made from carbon emissions? Yep, that's exactly what one biotech startup is doing. They're capturing carbon emissions that would normally be released into the atmosphere, warming the planet, and instead converting it into ethanol, which is then processed into one of the components used to make polyester. And voila, a dress is created. And don't think these are some soot-covered dresses better suited for a chimney sweep. Nope, these dresses are actually quite fashionable. You might be saying, wait, how can these be made of carbon emissions? How is that even possible? And perhaps you're asking, how can I get my hands on one? Well, stick around because that's what we're checking out in this week's episode. How are carbon emissions being captured? Why make clothing out of them? And how does this process help in fighting the climate crisis? Most importantly, we'll talk to that one group that's upcycling all of this into this. This is Jennifer Holmgren. She's the CEO of Lanzatech. That's the biotech startup we mentioned earlier. And Jennifer is on a mission to reduce our global carbon emissions while making really cool products that we use every day, including these dresses. 
Here's Jennifer. Our goal is to make sure that we put carbon in a circular economy and we reuse it over and over again, rather than dumping it into the air or into our oceans. And after more than 15 years of technology development and scaling up, Jennifer and Lanzatech believe they've got the solutions needed to lead the way into a new circular carbon economy. Using those solutions and some creative collaboration with clothing companies, they've created a collection for one of retail's largest brands that incorporates fabrics made with carbon emissions. We're making products that are identical and complete replacements. And that's actually one of the cool things, right? Because if you can do that, then people don't have to change the entire rest of your manufacturing cycle to be able to use it. But how do carbon emissions become clothing? Good question. Let's take a look. The journey starts at a steel mill, where instead of coming out of the chimney or smokestack as greenhouse gases, the carbon emissions are captured. Once that CO2 is captured, it is pumped into a bioreactor, which has bacteria swimming all through it. And right when the carbon makes its way into the bioreactor, the bacteria eats it up instantly, converting it into ethanol. Then the ethanol is recovered, cleaned, and shipped to India Glycos Limited, which is a separate company in, you guessed it, India. There, it's converted into monoethylene glycol. That's the building block of polyester. Exactly. Thanks, Jennifer. So then that monoethylene glycol building block is processed into a low carbon polyester yarn by a third company, Far Eastern New Century, in Taiwan. Then you've got your polyester fibers, and the rest is really no different than making clothes not from carbon emissions. Apparel companies and their supply chains use that polyester yarn to make the final pieces of clothing. Whew, that's a mouthful. Still with me? Think of it like a brewery where yeast turns sugar into alcohol in steel tanks. Lanzatech uses bacteria to ferment pollution into ethanol. The entire process from start to finish takes about four months to complete. Now, before we go on, let's pause for a quick lesson on today's polyester. You probably already know that polyester is basically a plastic material, and you might already know that plastic comes from petroleum. It's basically made from oil. So this process from Lanzatech not only captures and makes use of emissions that would normally pollute the planet, it also lowers the need to extract more fossil fuels from the ground to create new polyester. Okay, back to the show. So now you've got your dress. It's made out of captured carbon emissions. It's looking good. But can those emissions ever escape the dress and find their way into our atmosphere? Jennifer says, not likely. So we've prevented it from entering the atmosphere because now it's locked away in that dress. So unless you burn the dress or you decompose the dress in some way, which you're not going to do, it's locked in. How neat is that? Lanzatech promotes a carbon smart circular economy where carbon is locked into the material cycle and consumers can choose where their carbon comes from. We have the ability to give consumer the choice. Does somebody want to wear a recycled carbon dress or do they want to wear a dress that was made from petroleum? And that's what we're trying to create, a world where people have a choice of where their carbon comes from. Why are Lanzatech and clothing brands doing all this? Well, as you might have seen in recent years, the climate crisis is having major impacts on our planet, from extreme weather events, wildfires, severe droughts, and heat waves. It's affecting everything, from crop production, disruption of habitats, rising sea levels, the list goes on. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, or NRDC, the average global temperature in the past 50 years has increased at the fastest rate in recorded history, all of which is the direct result of us humans emitting a lot of greenhouse gases, mostly carbon, into our atmosphere and causing the global temperature to rise. According to a 2021 report from the UN, global emissions are expected to rise 16% by 2030, compared to 2010 levels. That puts the world off track for the 45% cut in emissions the climate scientists say is needed to meet the Paris Agreement's goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. That means if we don't take immediate action, the consequences will be major. With heat trapping carbon in the atmosphere causing more devastating effects, there will be no turning back. Yikes. But not only that, a report from the New England Journal of Medicine also suggests that the rising global temperatures will lead to many more deaths and could force 100 million people into extreme poverty by 2030. So what can be done? Well, to start, Lancetech has a goal over the next couple of years to prevent a million tons of CO2 from being emitted and instead turning it into products. That's like taking over 197,000 passenger vehicles off the road for one year. So far, the company has produced over 24 million gallons of low carbon intensity ethanol and has prevented 120,000 tons of CO2 from being emitted into the atmosphere. They hope that someday, everything that is used and bought will come from re-recycled carbon, not fresh fossil carbon. I would like people to understand this, that all these things are possible, that, that we need to just be working on technology, scaling technology, and that we need partners like Zara to get support from consumers 
so that they continue to try to lead a change. The company hopes to create future refineries and convert the ethanol in one location instead of shipping it out across the world, further cutting down on their own emissions. They also aren't stopping at clothing and plan to produce all sorts of products using their tech. Everything from bottles, aviation fuel, shoes, and rubber tires. So that's about it. Carbon emissions are captured and converted into ethanol through fermentation, which is then converted into low-carbon monoethylene glycol and turned into a low-carbon yarn which is then used to make fabric. All of this helps in limiting the release of carbon into our atmosphere. Cutting back is super important to offsetting global warming. So what are your thoughts on this emerging tech? Would you wear clothing made out of CO2? How else are you helping stop the climate crisis? Let us know in the comments below. Elon Musk is offering $100 million to teams that can figure out the best solutions to carbon removal technologies. I want to look into what it is, how it could help the world, and to see if there are some other uses that maybe caught Musk's attention so I can answer why Elon Musk is actually obsessed with carbon capture. The long-term goal of SpaceX is to make life multiplanetary. This is the chance that you get to save humanity and become a billionaire at the same time. Competition is in partnership with XPRIZE, which is an organization that runs competitions to encourage technological development to benefit humanity across a range of areas. But this is the biggest prize that they've ever offered, so it's got to be something that they think is vital, which really, it is. We release about 45 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. So to keep global temperature rise below 2 degrees Celsius, we're going to need to cut down on emissions but we're also gonna to need to actively remove gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere and store it away as part of the solution. The competition is open to any ideas that suck up CO2, but I just wanna focus on one specific type, direct air capture, or DAC. Most DAC tech uses huge fans to suck in air over some type of filter, which catches the CO2 using chemical reactions. It's then piped down into places like underground caverns and stored for long periods of time, taking it out of the planet's carbon cycle. Huge arrays of these things can be stacked, so in theory, it could be scaled up to take out gigatons of CO2 each year, which could make a pretty good dent in our yearly emissions. Currently, there's only a handful of DAC projects around the world, but a company called Climeworks is actually building the biggest ever right now in Iceland. It's called Orca, and it's gonna be able to suck up around 4,000 tons of CO2 each year. But at this point, you might be hearing all this and you might be thinking, wait, can't we just plant trees? Trees suck up CO2 out of the atmosphere and they use it to make more trees, so it's a fair question. But even though some carbon removal ideas do use trees to capture carbon, and even though if you've been watching any of my previous videos, you know that I think we should be planting as many trees and saving as many trees as possible, these DAC technologies are simply just able to take out way more CO2 than trees are in the same amount of space. A company called Climate Engineering even claims that just one of its plants could do the job of 40 million trees in literally a fraction of the space. And unlike trees and other plants, they can pretty much be placed anywhere on the planet. Plus, I'm thinking that Elon Musk is actually interested in this because he wants to use carbon capture in a place that doesn't exactly look too great for planting trees. Or is even on this planet. I'm talking about Mars. You've seen it on my channel, you've probably seen it everywhere else. Elon Musk wants humans on Mars. SpaceX is developing Starship to be the big space boat to take people to the red planet. The thing is gonna be the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built, but it still won't be able to carry the fuel it needs to make a return trip. So unless we wanna just abandon people on the red planet, we're gonna to need to figure this part out. And that is where carbon capture comes in, because CO2 can actually be a surprisingly useful gas. Let me explain. So Starship uses SpaceX's Raptor engines, which run on a mix of methane and oxygen. One of the reasons SpaceX actually went with this fuel is because we could actually make it on the surface of Mars using a simple reaction known as the Sabatier process, where if you combine CO2 and hydrogen, you can get water and methane. You can split that water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then you're just left with everything you need for Starship's rocket fuel. Which sounds pretty good, but that's not all. You could also use the water for drinking, for farming, for rehydrating foods, or you can combine it with more CO2 in different ways to be used in agriculture or even to make plastic, which obviously would be extremely useful on Mars for making stuff, including more habitat to live in. 
So from just one baseline bit of chemistry, living on Mars and getting back safely becomes a whole lot more feasible. And to start all of this off, you would just need hydrogen and CO2. Hydrogen could be sent on an uncrewed starship before a human mission, or it could be taken from the huge amount of water ice on the surface of Mars. And the great thing about Mars' atmosphere is that it's about 95% CO2. So for the CO2 part of the process, you just need a way to get it out of the air. Something like, oh, I don't know, direct air capture technology? When Elon Musk tweeted about this whole competition, someone asked him about this and he clearly hinted that he obviously knows direct air capture has uses beyond climate change. It's actually been part of SpaceX's plan all along. They've always known that they're going to need a way to create fuel on Mars, and they're meant to be starting to trial the idea later this year. But there is still a lot that needs to be solved, including literally the idea of getting CO2 out of Mars's atmosphere. Because even if direct air capture technology sounded pretty amazing earlier on in this video, it's still got a long way to go. Like, it currently uses a lot of power. It's actually one of the biggest things that's holding it back right now. It makes it really expensive, and if we want to run it on renewable energy, which really we should, then there's actually only going to be specific places that we can set them up. Some estimates even say that to remove the CO2 of just one cement factory, your direct air capture plant is going to need to be powered by a wind farm the size of Brussels. So all of this, combined with the upfront cost to actually scale these things up, means that we need a lot of innovation and investment. And that is why this new XPRIZE competition is so sweet. Sure, Musk might be most interested in it because it's going to help us survive on Mars and actually get back from Mars, but it's also going to directly impact life on Earth too. If we can combine lowering emissions with actually sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, then we're going to be on the road to hitting net zero and even negative emissions in the future. And we'll also be able to not abandon people on Mars. Which is also pretty great. <laughs> Carbon capture is expensive, and many people insist it must be generated by renewable power. But a wind farm that can power a direct air capture plant takes a huge amount of land, resources, and energy. So does planting crops and growing trees. To manage the space and cost of carbon capture, doesn't it make more sense to capture carbon and other flue gases of hard-to-abate industries such as the coal industry? Doesn't it make more sense to utilize the devil incarnate environmental lobby groups perceive as the enemy? With carbon capture technologies and innovative companies such as Climeworks, Carbon Engineering, Lanza Tech, and CCM Technologies, Humanity has the potential to redeem and use CO2 and other so-called pollutants for good, to help renewables provide electricity and let everyone shine like the sun. With redemption and utilization of what many see as garbage, pollution, or waste, people all over the world will realize the holy city the new heaven and earth coming down out of heaven, dressed as a bride for her husband, John the Divine, envisioned 2,000 years ago. Farmers will keep their farms and sustain healthy, happy human families and diverse communities, reducing the need for government or corporate-imposed solutions people do not want or need. No one will feel like an anathema, or be treated like one. The end of the Bronze and Iron Ages have arrived. The Carbon Age is at hand. For more on this subject, please visit my website at https www.lindavoturner.ca And yeah, help me get this news out. Thank you for listening.